Welcome to a very exciting episode of Experience Focused Leaders. I'm delighted to introduce you to Tim Ash, a highly rated keynote speaker, presenter, and an author of two uh, really fascinating books, Unleash Your Primal Brain, and somewhat related and unrelated, we'll cover that more, Lending Page Optimization, with over 50,000 copies sold, effectively the uh, Bible of Conversion Optimization, translated to six languages. Tim, welcome to the pod. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Great to be with you. Listen, I, I didn't do the full justice to your background because this is you're not just writing books. You actually ran an agency that was focused on this optimization and a lot more for driving growth for marketing organizations. And you're advising CMOs in top companies now as their truth teller. But tell us a little bit about the background of what drove you to write books that are frankly not related as we were discussing earlier. You wouldn't expect an evolutional psychology book and a conversion optimization book to come from one person. Well, you would if you knew my background. So I, yeah. I attended UC San Diego and double majored in computer engineering and cognitive science. So I've always been interested in the brain. And I almost finished my PhD. I quit seven years in when I was working on AI and neural networks, I guess what would be called data-driven modeling uh, these days. And uh, then I started a digital marketing agency, one of the OGs, you could say, in conversion rate optimization called Site mm -hmm. Tuners, and ran that for about 20 years. And over the course of our work there, we worked with the uh, Expedia's, Nestle's, Google's of the world on down to much more nimble, high energy companies and created 1.2 billion in value for those companies that we can document. And the root of it, where most of the value came from, was from what I guess you'd describe as neuromarketing or evolutionary mm -hmm. psychology applied to decision making and consumer choices. And that's such a rich ground that I'd say anybody who wants to have a good marketing career should really understand evolutionary psychology and how we make decisions. So I guess you'd say I've come full circle and the latest book, Unleash Your Primal Brain, demystifying how you think, how we think and why we act is basically the operating system for all human beings and uh, what we picked up along the way in our evolution. Very readable, no jargon in there. And it can definitely be applied to marketing and what I found to be the biggest source of wins for uh, our clients So uh, when I ran the agency. Let, let's dig into this intersection of the two. I've read a book called Neural Marketing at, at some point because I was really fascinated into you know, both areas that, that we've described marketing mm -hmm. and obviously what drive us. What drives us? I think in the human behavior, there's a lot of components, right? There's the cognitive, but there's also social, behavioral science sure. driving that. So I was always fascinated into kind of combining those two. So guide us a little bit on, first of all, how do you define neural marketing? And when you advise your clients now, how do you integrate all of the components of the broader human species, right? Like it's not just the evolutionary biology that drives us, but also the environment that we live in right now. Mm, um, yeah. And I, I, obviously they're all connected, but I'd love to get your story, like starting from your marketing and then how to translate it into something that's universally relevant. Okay. Uh, well, that was a lot of different questions, but yeah, I'll, I'll try yeah. to unpack them one at a time. So my definition of neuromarketing, it's uh, no reason to, to fancy it up, is basically psychology applied to marketing. And psychology is rooted in our evolution. So evolutionary psychology in particular is the important branch. So the way to think about it and the way I structured my book is we picked up a lot of things from very early life that all life on earth share. For example, dopamine, how to determine whether to expend energy in the pursuit of a goal. That's a pretty universal kind of thing. Fruit flies have it and mm. humans, right? And, and then there are things at the end of our evolutionary arc that are very bizarrely and uniquely human and what allowed us to take over the whole planet, basically. And so you have to understand what part of the decision-making is making the decision. It could be a very primitive part or it could right. be a very human part. So the arc of evolution is important. But then when you're applying it to a complex environment, you have to basically think, what is our kind of deep-seated survival level goal at the moment? Is it I'm hungry or I want to mate or I want to run away from danger? That determines what we pay attention to and 
which environmental kind of stimulus we have a strong reaction to. So those emotions are essentially prioritizing the right choice for us. So this happening psych, I guess you could say subconsciously, completely automatically beyond our understanding, but it's working 24 hours a day to make decisions for us. The rational brain literally cannot make decisions. That part of the brain is only on a very small percentage of the time and gives us options. But our emotions, our embodied response to it, including our memories, our current state, everything are what actually do the deciding. Got it. So what I'm hearing is you're not dismissing the social and all this environments that we live in, but you're saying they are just the kind of the later stage maybe, or some smaller portion of our decision-making process. And oh. it kind of starts at the core, right? Like at the core of the your crocodile brain, and then it continues. That, that's that's the basic idea. But the social yeah. stuff, we're the most social animal on the planet. We form the right. largest social groups and we literally can't survive by ourselves. So it's very important for us to be loyal to the tribe. A lot of things come out of that. For example, it's more important for us to be a good team player than to be right. So we'll actually override our own direct life experience in order to fit into a group and propagate the cultural package of that group. That's that in our politics today and in a lot of other venues. But the point is we need to be tribal and good team players to survive. And a lot of times that's what's actually driving our decision-making. And being and cast could, out of a tribe and excommunicated is actually the worst thing that could happen to us from a survival standpoint, even though the stakes aren't the same anymore. Interesting. So if we take a leap into the conversion rate optimization, the, but that's fun to go back and forth between these two concepts. This would be a call to action that says 84% of customers just like you have selected us for X, Y, and Z reasons. So you're trying to connect some call to actions will be signifying a social acceptance. Yes, yeah, certainly uh, social, social proof, proof is important. Yeah. Social proof is critical. You're standing in front of two restaurants. One has a line out the door, the other one's empty. Which one are you going to go for? Actually, you'll wait in line unless you're from the former Soviet Union like us when you don't want to wait in lines anymore. But you'll stand in line because that's social proof. That's the only indicator you have of whether something has quality or popular or accept. Uh, you won't go into the empty one, even though you could have a table right now. So the obvious question that people outside of maybe marketing and persuasion sciences world will have is that means that we're manipulated all the time, right? And there is good actor, good acting around using these foundational principles of human nature. And then there is ways where we need to defend ourselves against the bad actors. So um, guy, guy you're, you're right on it. You're right on half of that. We are being manipulated. The fact is we can't do much about it. The second part yeah. is unfortunately not true. So there's a famous study where in this retail environment, you could buy French wines or German wines. I know you spend a lot of time in France. And in the background, they'd play either stereotypically like German oompa music or French romantic ballads. Mm -hmm. And people would buy more French wine or German wine based on the background music right. about two to one. And they'd get skewed in either direction. But if you ask them, why did you buy that Riesling? They wouldn't say it's because of the German music in the background. Uh, so we are being manipulated all the time and we can't do anything about it. Uh, casinos are notorious for this. They'll pump oxygen in. They will show you on the roulette wheel or rather the, uh, what is it called? The slot machine wheel on almost like two sevens and half a seven. I almost got there. That makes you chase the goal even more. Yeah. So the reality is we're manipulated and we can't do much about it because the, all of this happens in our subconscious brain. We can't think about every decision we make all day long. In fact, we make poorer decisions later in the day when we've used up our reserves of what's called executive function, our conscious thought. So I don't want to be that pessimistic, right? So let's say <laughs> let's say we have we're talking about kids and like what how do you manage, for example, their informational diet? And there there is a there's probably some mediums that are a lot more seductive to making easy kind of intuitive uh, decisions and some that are suboptimal, right? So I, to speaking of environments, you turn on Netflix, you then you immediately go, your brain goes to, oh, okay, let's go get some food from the <laughs> fridge. And mm. right, you've got the serve combo 
of like behaviors, kind of naughty beha- quote unquote naughty behaviors. Yes. And I, I wonder to what degree we as marketers and as educators can help nudge people in the direction that may be good for our business, but also is good for them in the long run. Yeah. And now we're getting into the realm of ethics a little bit, and it's an important one. We can do this for good or evil. You can make, you can divide people and make them hate each other and think of other groups as subhuman and, and commit genocide. That's one way to do it. Or you could say, hey, all healthy eaters in the school cafeteria just put put the fruit and the vegetables at the beginning of the line where I'm more likely to grab them when I'm hungry, not at the end of the line after I got my dessert and chocolate milk. So there are ways to nudge behavior. So, primacy, by so you're getting, using psychological concepts, right? Like primacy and you know, whatever to in, encourage people in the direction of what's going to be good for them. Yes. Or for example, there have been a lot of effective ways to get people to save for retirements. We tend to discount the future because it's not likely to work out the way we plan it anyway. Uh, But if you have an automatic, anytime you get a raise, let's put uh, half of your increase in your pay into your retirement fund. It happens automatically. That's a great way to help people save. So you can influence positive decisions with marketing. Uh, There's nothing wrong with that. How, so back to the sort of the executive function concept that you said, right? So let's assume we are reasonably ethical, right? But there's still some degree of education that people need or some sort of like going on a journey, personalizing. It's to commit to certain behaviors, right? Because it's one thing is like, was your advice, we convert, right? But then there is a difference between converting and behavioral change. And one of the thought processes for us as we work a lot was employee benefits, for example, education and related to making the right investment decisions and so on. So making, how do you help people really understand how to take advantage of what's good for them, participate in a wellness program? It's a sad story is there's a lot of things that companies pay for that people don't use because they don't know it exists. They don't engage with how they could, how it could be relevant to them and their lifestyle. It's a one-time mm. event in, in November, choosing your you know benefits for the new year. So this is a very real example how companies spend a lot of money and they're getting relative minimal outcome from the some of the investments okay. and people. Well, 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 yeah. I think, I, I, so if I get your question, it's how do you nudge people towards the right behavior and make sure they stay on the right track? I, and there's... educating, yeah, internalizing yeah. it. So there's a difference between short-term conversion, like clicking on a clickbaity something, and actually saying, oh, this is a step for the me that I want to be. Right. Okay. And, There's so let, let's talk about that. So I don't conversion has this bad reputation of you're just trying to sell me something and shove me down the sales funnel. And I look at conversion events, it could be anything. It could be a click, like you say, it could be filling out a phone call, it could be signing up for something or consuming content. Those are all conversion events depending on the context. But they have to be lined up around this idea of a customer journey. The sales funnel is the simplest form of it. You've probably heard of like awareness, interest, desire, and action. And for you have to take people where they are. So you can't say, buy now when they have don't even know they have a problem. So a lot of content needs to, I think, is neglected for the top of the funnel. And if you create mm-hmm. content for that awareness and interest stage before I'm making the decision even, before your company can financially benefit from it, that's where I really need the support. And once you lock me into you guys as a good source of information, then I'm much more likely to stay with you. So I think that most marketers compete for the bottom of the funnel, which is which gets real expensive and has to be just noise and interrupt driven. And they make the mistake of actually not helping people throughout their whole life cycle of their problem. Uh, To answer your question about how to get people to adopt better behaviors, uh, there's two specific strategies that I would lean into. One is the default. What is the default for the default should be whatever makes the most profit for your business and is of the most benefit to your clients. Famous case of this is, for example, organ donation in California, where we spend some of our time, you have to opt in to being an organ donor on your driver's license. Mm -hmm. Only a small percentage of people do that. 
I forget which European country, I believe it's Austria, their default is an opt out. You're automatically an organ donor unless you choose to opt out of it. And they have mm -hmm. a much higher uptake rate and a lot more people benefit from organ donation as a result. So we consider what is my default? What happens if they do nothing? Because most people will do nothing most of the time. Our brain right. is a lazy energy lazy, conserving yeah. machine. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So what happens if I literally do nothing? That should be the suggested or best case option. So the so choice architecture defaults. matters a lot. Yeah. So what is the default? Are, yeah, yeah. Smart defaults is the answer. Yeah. And, and then the other part is social yeah. pressure. If you externalize an accountability, then people are much more likely to do it and commit to it and carry through. So if you, uh, if you have a workout buddy, I'll see you at the gym on Tuesday at 8 a.m. God, I, I feel horrible this morning. I don't want to go, but my friend's going. And so it makes you accountable. So anytime you make people externalize their... And other people can inspect the results of what they're doing. They're more likely to keep their commitments. So that's back to that using the social pressure, social pressure, not absolutely. losing the reputation. As yeah. A Are you a person, person of integrity? Do you keep yeah. your word? Yeah. That mm -hmm. sort of thing. Yeah. So that's really so. Your take is that you you reduce complexity to some degree it was defaults. And you did like, what's interesting to me is you didn't bring up educating people that much. A little bit on the, on a little bit, you brought it up in the sense of tech telling about the problem, but this is, there's a little bit of a tension between removing friction and then going deep into the problem. And I'm curious, how do you recommend mm. to solve it? And I'll actually quote you from one of uh, the interviews from the landing page optimizations book. Uh, uh -oh. You said you have to have a singular focus and discipline and be very clear about what desired conversion action is on your landing page. Yes. Everything else should be de-emphasized or ruthlessly eliminated. So on, a, on the face of it, I'm totally in with you, right? But okay. the, then how do you, but at the same time, like this educational component, right? Like that, that is, oh, I'm going to have to read. I'm going to have to think, or mm -hmm. there is, there is a tension between eliminating content and actually having some substance that okay. people believe in. And well, we worked a lot with people around that. I'm like, I, yeah, 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 but, but I, I, challenging I, I, problem, right? Like in, to me, at least. It, it is, but you quoted me out of context and I just want to reframe it a little bit. So when I'm talking about calls to action on a landing page or on a website, if you have 17 things I might want to do on that page and you don't prioritize them for me, guess who the idiot is? Not me for not doing any of them. It's you for creating that choice architecture. So you should right. have a for every page on your site, whether it's your homepage or a specific landing page for a campaign, you should have priorities of which conversion actions are most valuable to you. If you make more money, if I call you, then make the, the toll free number more prominent rather than fill out this form. You right. should be very clear about visually and in terms of screen real estate and emphasis, how to prioritize the conversion actions. And there it's choice overload that I was basically commenting about. With regard to educating people and thinking about more them investing time in it, that seems a little pedantic to me. You're insisting that they pay attention and they'll only pay attention if they care. So one mm. of the things you should do, and I think your content platforms, for example, help solve this, is have it in a lot of different media. Okay, mm. you can have a slide deck, you could have a PDF, you can have a, a recording of this as a video, you could have an interactive quiz or a guide, whatever format they want to consume it, make it easy for them. And also breaking it up into bite-sized chunks. When I did my LinkedIn learning class on neuromarketing, each little section is three minutes. You have three minutes? Okay. If you say, this is going to be a one-hour class, I don't have an hour, but I have three minutes and I can watch that next section. So breaking it up, even if it's long-form content, into bite-sized chunks is critical because, as you said, people have the attention span of a lit match these days. Yeah, a little goldfish on cocaine. Exactly. <laughs> kind of like probably something <laughs> like that. Yeah. So that's what you're saying uh, fundamentally is – shrink the change and shrink the informational overload as much as possible. But I'll give me an easy set of 
ways to continue three minutes, three more minutes. Like that feels yeah, like intuitive. attention resets. So if you're looking about video, anything like that's uh serial, for example, audio or video, we watch that linearly. Okay. You need to have an attention reset in under seven or eight minutes. So it's guy, you have to break it up into chunks at most that long, seven or eight minutes. So how do you, how, then let's dive in. Let's apply your book to the Netflix paradigm, right? People okay. can spend hours uh obviously watching netflix late into the night obviously when their decision making powers are its weakest <laughs> and is it that the series itself creates these moments that kind of create tension like you know and, and breaks uh, to no no no, no look people uh, to watch or kind of, how do we think about no that? they're just enjoying it that's entertainment that's something we're doing voluntarily for whatever our motives are to decompress to escape we identify with the storytelling or love the story stories are very powerful a separate subject happy to talk about that and their yeah. evolutionary purpose but no those are things that we even enjoy looking for stuff to watch on netflix like i'll right. spend time looking for a show the same thing in, in terms of looking for books or something like that. We, we enjoy doing that is inherently enjoyable. I don't think that's the same as a marketing decision. Most marketing decisions are based on, I have a problem. I'm not sure exactly what it is often. I need to solve it. I'm not going to just look at every choice I have or spend a lot of time doing it. In fact, the right answer is spend as little time as right. possible solving my problem. This is not an enjoyable experience like watching Netflix, which I do voluntarily. So you're distinguishing maybe between business decisions, B2B, or like some sort of a complex. But what about like buying a car? Like how would you consider the fact that some people just spent enormous amounts of hours researching that? Is that because they're enjoying it? Is it like a risk of making a... They're maximizers and they risk making you afraid of making a wrong decision. People go research on Amazon things that cost seven dollars for hours looking at various options. Like there's that. Well, there's right? yeah, there's that may not be appropriate. And so, um, so the way to think about it is what's the magnitude of the impact of the decision? Sometimes we can't sure. even tell that in real time in terms of kind of consumer or individual decisions, there's a clear hierarchy. The most important choice you'll ever make in your life is your spouse or the person you yeah. choose to have kids with, if that's your yeah. objective. House, car. So it, they're big decisions. It makes sense to spend time researching, okay. evaluating, managing the risks and so on, because the consequences are long lasting and severe. Let's put it that way. For smaller stuff, yeah, I don't really... It doesn't make sense for me to optimize a lot of things. I'd rather go to the 7-Eleven, which is geographically close, and that's their whole thing, and overpay for it. I'm not going right. to go to Target to buy a box of Tic Tac mints. I'll just go to 7-Eleven. Got it. So what you're saying is, assuming people behave rationally and kind of align. Wait, kind no, of they like, don't. Yeah, 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 that's they, what I'm saying. They yeah, don't yeah. do that. I what I what What's fascinating to me is that there are, like, if, if we go into the two there's I, i'm forgetting which book it's from but i think it's jonathan hates kind of wrote about it, at least there's maximizers and satisfizers right and there's people who are maximizers they actually do go in the cerebral mode or they think they do and they start tuning up and studying everything and they're really like risk averse of making a suboptimal decision and they tend to be very stressed people. And then mm -hmm. and then there are some that are satisfiers, like, hey, this is good enough. I'll go to 7-Eleven type of things, right? And what I'm hearing you say is, look, depending on the decision you're making, you may become a little bit more maximizer or satisfizer. But yeah. I'm curious what your research talks about that. First of all, let me be, again, restate this. This is chapter one in my book, which is the lie of rationality. We can't make logical decisions. All the rational brain can do is give us options. They're automatically prioritized by the strength of our emotional reaction. Mm. So it's, I need to do this or I need to avoid this. Right. Right. The, so the ranking is happening emotionally. They've there have been people have had various brain issues, and if one, that part of the brain is separated from the rest or doesn't exist, they literally can't make decisions. So there is no right. such thing as a Mister Spock logical decision ever. Okay. Now, how much energy do we devote to deciding on a goal or decision? It depends on the context. So, for example, I say, okay, 
Alex, here's a uh, you're in, on a shoe buying site and find the best hiking shoes. Okay, here's a page with 20 different ones. Okay, and you're hurrying out the door and you need them for your hiking trip next week. They need to arrive by Amazon. Okay, versus hey Alex, you need to find the running shoes or hiking shoes in size ten and a half that are the cheapest ones on this site, or I will kill you. Right. Now you're going to approach that context very differently. You may spend hours looking at that website. So yeah. it's really your motivation, which goal is salient, a lot of other factors that go into it, but it's not a personality trait. Yeah. Some people may be a little more OCD in terms of uh, doing things, but the right answer is satisficing. And that's, has been shown economically, which is once you've seen a large enough sample mm -hmm. size, pick the next best one that comes along. That's Pretty shown to be pretty close to optimal decision making. Optimal now, decision, but then you now, still to do that. You need a not... sample size that's long, large enough. You you need a sample size so you get a good sense for things. But your point, whether you're maximizing or you're satisfying, bottom line is you're still what you're doing is you're just projecting your emotions into kind of and you're framing them in a little bit of a kind of yeah. yeah. What, what you think is a rational decision, but in reality- No, no, yeah, exactly. So they've shown this, that people make a decision and you can see that on brain scans and happening yeah. in their head. Then when you have some fraction of a second later, the conscious language part of the brain kicks into rationalizing. And so Robert Heinlein, when a science fiction author once said, man or mankind, man is not a rational animal. Man is a rationalizing animal. So whatever comes out of mm -hmm. your mouth as an explanation for something, that's bullshit. And that's not why you made the decision. That's just an alibi after the fact. It's fascinating. We do see what, exactly what you're describing in, in some of the content that we present. So there's certain things where if you add a background video that creates a certain sense of awe and, or an emotional connection that people just go immediately, they go, they, I love this, right? This is bringing me, my ideas to life. This is making me look good. They, they immediately project themselves. Or if there is, if they think of themselves, I'm a, like a very time efficient person. And then they see dynamic navigation and they go, oh, this is me. But the way they justify it, typically, like we look at our, like our clients, the way they justify oftentimes is, oh, I could see the analytics and the ROI. Mm -hmm. But they're buying the initial reaction is very much, oh, this is in line with how I want to be in the world. Yeah. So this the, is, the, like, the fits into my, my yeah, vision it, for my exactly. Company. And I would say that don't use focus groups mm -hmm. necessarily to decide what to do because people are there, they're getting the payoff for being evaluated, probably paid or paid attention to as part of your focus group. When we used to do usability testing on websites, when I ran my agency, we would do two very important things. One was time constraint it. You have 30 seconds to do the following. Second, watch what they do. Yeah. Don't talk to them in the middle or have them talk in the middle of it. Just watch their actions. And then if you want to ask a follow-up focus group question or two, that's fine afterwards, but just know that you, know, you may get some insights for it, from it, but that's not what really happens. So time constrain it because most people, like we said, have very short attention spans and watch their actions. It's as simple as that. It's funny. When I when you said time constrain it, uh, I thought what you're going to, to go is, is like that you're going, if you time constrain it, you don't have time to get your rationalizing, overthinking brain to start thinking about what you've asked and you're going with the kind of natural instinct what before you can explain mm -hmm. why that is and the reason i that, that this makes a lot of sense is we like so we capture what people do on screens through the just mm -hmm. the software right like, sure do i get to this page what do i do it or do i click on this button do i do i keep hovering around and exploring things like it's in an aisle in a bookstore or do i move somewhere else immediately and that's really interesting very interesting insight because if you do an interview of that person, they like some people like would claim that they've done something that they haven't even accessed the digital experience, and other people <laughs> like they're so they're, they're rationalizing they, they, it after yeah, the fact. They're, they're, they're rational, so there's just like seeing what people do versus what they want to tell you, what they want to do. Right. Yep. Those are two very different things. And it goes back to Ogilvy talking about like those concepts, right? Like you really got to see the behavior, but the time, you know, I, I wanted to push you on the time. Is it really the time constraint that gives you the clarity 
of like the gut primal uh, or so so again it's yeah I, I think i feel like my judgment is that you keep coming back to this idea of more time lets us be more rational and deliberate that's not first of all that's not the case so we're not doing it for that reason when i would put a time constraint on some kind of usability test it would mainly be to simulate the fact that you don't give a crap which is most of the time how we're interacting with websites so it's to lessen the attention or the care that you put into it not the rational part of the mind the rational part doesn't exist okay so it's the time has nothing to do with that but it's to just simulate the lack of attention that most people do most tasks with online so how so let's take a step back right mm -hmm. using what you've done right to like look before i make a convert in something that i don't know anything about you need to educate mm -hmm. me about the problem i need to feel like it's a relevant problem to me you need to keep my interest in it. And then maybe at some point I convert, right? Like we build trust or whatnot. We believe a lot in the mind share, right? If you uh, create distractions, like a lot of content could create distractions, like you were saying, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm watching it. I'm looking at a PDF that's theoretically very interesting to me. Like I need to make an important decision, but then they, they were kind enough to provide a video. I click on that video and then we see we have data that people never come back to to that experience because the video is in YouTube and then they get an ad and they get like distracted and move on to mm -hmm. the next sure. and then they have to switch gears and come back to the original site that it is, which is a different environment. Yeah, it's That's not a sales very, funnel. It's more random yeah, billiard crazy balls. That it, yeah, bowling balls. Which B2B company is going to outperform YouTube algorithm that's optimized to distract you? I don't know. They have to be very good, right? Like to, So that was a very interesting driver for us to say, if I'm interested in the topic, if our clients are interested in learning something, we need to nurture that in a very precise way where we give them this video medium, right, that they like, that gives them a break maybe from reading, maybe humanizes some things for a story, uh, but doesn't distract them. And then when they're done with the video, they're able to move on further and get more mind share, and then eventually get to that conversion, quote of order, mm -hmm. persuasion event. So that's our hypothesis in, like, in the data that we're seeing validates it, but I'm curious what you... Because what, what really triggered me a little bit is that remove all the noise. And I know you meant it like at the, towards the end of the, of the funnel, right? Like to when you're driving, when you're really about the driving event. But to me, like there's some noise, some mind share, some kind of progressive levels of education that I feel like we need to have in order to stand out because information okay, well, let, there's so much information right yeah so I, again there's you're bringing up a lot let me see if i can unpack a little bit of it yeah uh, first yeah. of all i don't see the conversion event as at the bottom of the funnel i see a customer journey sideways and, right. and there are micro conversions to advance you along that okay and okay, all of it. those are important if any of them break even if it's earlier in the traditional funnel you lost them Okay, so right. it's not so about the get them to the buy lending, or sign yeah. up. Right. That's not the conversion action. There are dozens potentially of conversion actions, including consuming content along right. the way. Okay, take them where they are, map the whole customer journey and have stuff, for God's sakes, have stuff for people early in the process when you can't make money off of them. They still need the help and no one's offering that because they're all trying to make money off of them and, and just squeeze that tit at the bottom of the sales funnel to try to make money come out. That's really good. I call that greedy marketer syndrome. Don't do that. Address the yeah. whole customer journey. And especially, like you say, the awareness, interest, educational stuff, that's right. really high in, or early in the customer journey. Do not neglect that. And the micro conversions, make, consuming that content eventually lead to more you know, marketing qualified leads or something. I get it. So what you're saying, and, and thank you for pushing me on this, is that the you're treating that educational step as itself a micro conversion event towards building trusts or Absolutely. towards building yeah. 
establishing some sort of bi-directional and, and momentum right? you're momentum. sliding them along that customer journey instead right. of trying to make them jump do standing broad jumps to get to the next step right. that's important so the, then the other thing that you mentioned was about how to can you, i still feel that there's this sense that you need to spoon feed them a lot of content and it, Yes, you do, but it needs to be appropriate to the stage in the funnel and their roles. For example, when you're talking about B2B as opposed to a consumer purchase, the consumer purchase is it's the personal risk to me. Okay, I might lose money. It might not work for its intended purpose. I could have gotten it cheaper somewhere else. It's those kind of decisions. When you overlay that on a B2B purchase of a significant amount, then you also have company risk. Mm. This could blow up the way that our company operates. I could lose my job. Mm. Those That's another layer of it. So it's not like B2B buyers are different than consumers, but B2B buyers have other risks that they have to mitigate. So a lot of the content we developed for our B2B clients when I ran the agency was role specific. Here's for the CFO, the life cycle costs of doing this system. Here's for the end user. Here's for the person maintaining the system. Okay, so each of them need to be addressed individually and have their own concerns and, and customer journey. So that's the difference, I would say, is it needs to be role-based. And within each role, there's that customer journey. There's their own journey. Yeah. And so this is really fascinating because one of the customers that we really admire, they created something that they call architecture in their words, but it's effectively, you can pick the persona, pick the type of company you are. And yeah. then within that, you pick the persona that you are in that company. Mm -hmm. So you're going like a level deeper. And then the next level, you're going down the business goals that you have as that particular persona, because it's, they could have multiple business goals. And what was interesting to us is they weren't sure what you're going to pick, right? Like people claim that they'll have some personalization technology that will mm -hmm. immediately figure out who you are and what you want. But I think that kind of maybe works in B2C much better than in B2B because I, I be like these things are messy. And sometimes when you're making a decision, you need to consider multiple personas, right? Like if you're the sponsor of the product, you need to know you need to present the information to the CFO and the, the CIO, right? So it's so what they did really interesting is they let you choose the areas that you will care about the most. And there are kind of a couple choices that made like, hey, I'm going to get to the golden carrot, the golden, whatever the gold at the end was that I'm going to get to exact information that I need. But I also know that if I have a different role, I have different people on my team that they have similar journeys and I could access them. What is your thought about something that's very narrow, not noisy, and just specific to that persona or getting this initial architecture from which you can then choose who you are and what you care about as a way of presenting? It almost feels like there's two different philosophies. Those are uh, similar to what I talk about. And again, in my landing page optimization book, I talk about roles and tasks and decomposing things along those customer journey lines, but for each role. So there's nothing here that's contradictory. What you just said to me says, you, you have a person, they have a, a customer journey. You need to address their concerns at every stage of that customer journey. It seems completely in line to me, but you have to design it for those roles and tasks. I hate the word persona that came out of the advertising world. And it's if you're doing media buying, Jane is a professional who works in finance right, right. and likes to hang out in bars in Soho on our off on our on Friday nights. Maybe that helps you visualize a Jane-like segment, but it's completely useless because it, it, you're not addressing the real needs in the role. So I think role and task-based is much more powerful way to think about it as opposed to personas. They're just the okay. kind of a shorthand for communicating for within an ad agency. So what I'm hearing is you generally, as long as the atomic level is a role and a task, Mm -hmm. It's okay to combine those. There's three roles in this particular domain. And so we can, here's a master landing page, so to speak. Yeah. And, and from that master or master presentation, and from there you go, okay. No, it's not a master product. presentation. Wait, sorry. I, I can see where you're going with this. It's not a master presentation. The landing page is raise your hand. Who are you? 
I'm the CFO, I'm the end user of this system, I'm the administrator or maintainer of this system. That's it. There's no information on that page. And then you take them to subsites that address their specific role Got in the customer journey. There's no gen general combined information. The first question you ask is, who the hell are you? So Got we it. know how to relate to you. So you set the never jump them frame? up to that. Yeah, yeah, you never jump them up to a more general scope after that. You keep them within the scope that's specific to their role and never let them escape. Which, by the way, like you're talking about the YouTube videos, all of your videos should be embedded in your site. You never take them off your site. That would be crazy. So the reason, that, so that's interesting because what, what you're implying is that you never let them off, but what if they, what if there are different stakeholders, right? So to me, I could be a stakeholder, but then my customer in the value that I <laughs> deliver to them is sometimes yeah. even more important, frankly. Le le legit. Uh, and that's how, yeah. so for example, yeah. I used to run an international conference series on conversion rate optimization called Conversion yeah. Conference in the US and Europe for about 14 years. And one of the things we had was hey, a guide for getting your boss to approve you coming to this conference. It wasn't for the end user. They're, they're gonna, they want to come to the conference. Right. They had to justify it to their boss. I'm going to learn a bunch of stuff. I'll be upgraded. I'll be more valuable. I can share my learnings with the rest of the team. We were giving them a guidebook for how to deal with another role. So uh, how to sell this inside your company, if it's a big B2B sale with a high ticket attached to it, there's probably three or four decisions. Gord Hodgkiss had a great little book, I don't know if it's still available, called The Biosphere Project. And he was saying things get really complicated when you have more than three or four decision makers and likelihood of sale goes down. It's largely because you in one role are not effective at communicating to someone about their role and what they care about and their risk factor. So it's really important that you have other ways to sell inside your company and pre-prepared materials to hand to people in other roles. So basically your champion needs to be, we call it champion enablement. So mm -hmm. you need to, some champions don't know what they don't know, right? They, so you want to give them as much of the easy playbook to be successful. Exactly. Michelle is the CFO. I, I, I have, here's a whole packet or whatever I can yeah. send to her. Great. That I don't need to know that, but I, I have to trust that the material is quality enough and targeted at the CFO position in this context. So I think inadvertently you brought up one of the biggest challenges in the B2B world today, that there are yep. a number of decision makers is increasing. Uh -huh. And so that's why we were going back to like, how do you architect this kind of who am I and what are my roles and responsibilities? Or it feels even for relatively tactical kind of point solutions right now, they need to be approved by historically, it was like in technology sales, it's like HR, or sorry, IT needs to approve something and then the kind of CFO and the buyer. And now right. there's 15 other like other tools that we're using and the owners of those tools and the end users are the champion. So we need to do the end user buy in the, the sponsors and, and, and it feels complex. How do you see, do you see that has become more complex over time? Buying decisions was more. Yeah, that's a tension. Within and, and, B2B, yeah. there's a tension and it, uh, groceries, I forget, Scott used to keep this marketing technology dashboard. I think they're like 8,000 or 12,000. Yeah, we had Scott on, on and he talked about it. Like it's, it, there's a lot, but there's consolidation now, right? That's yeah, it's, it's, like that's the of, tension. Exactly. Yeah, that's the tension yeah. I wanted to talk about. You can either have the all-in-one suites that do nothing yeah. particularly well, or you can have the cutting edge point solutions, but then you have to crazy glue them to work together and put a bunch of custom stuff in to, to make the work. There's no right answer here. It's a question of how customized is do you truly need for your application would be one high level thing I'd be thinking about. And the other is, are the restrictions of an all-in-one suite too onerous for us and don't support our business model? That's how I think about it. But so you're that's right. A buyer, but that's a buyer process, but let's yes. say you're a seller and let's just assume that whereas last year you had, or 10 years ago, we had three roles that were involved in the purchase of our product yeah. and the decision. And now there is seven. 
I'm not, I'm not saying so the what, number, you can do anything about that number of buyer complexity. What I am saying is that, for example, even a, let's say a CFO role of deciding on a, on some change, we would want to even and considering switching costs, this is, this, our solution is a lot cheaper to maintain and, and, and pay for the administrator of a system. They don't want to pull something out and do something else. You want to have a migration guide, okay, to make sure that it's, it's not just Easy, ours a system is better, but we're not putting extra work on your plate in order to do the migration. It's largely automated. Push one button and you're on the new system and we've sucked in all the stuff from your old system. So they have very specific needs, however many roles that are important in your buying scenario, you need to really think about what they care about. And again, for the administrator or something, it's how much work, how much extra work is it for me? And you have to address that basic primal thing for them. Understand. So what you're basically saying is it's still humans with specific concerns. Yeah. And it does it, it's not it doesn't matter if there's five or seven people yeah. in the decision. You need to address each role and, and not persona, role and their, yeah, their exactly. problems and what they need to do in a way that makes the ability to go there without friction. Yeah, uh, it de-risks it for them. It gets rid of the fear for them and they feel comfortable and safe. That The ultimate goal in a B2B sale is safety. I'm not going to get the, the old saying, you don't get fired for buying IBM because that was like the safe choice back in the day for computer systems. It's, it's mm -hmm. the same thing. It's I don't necessarily want to make the the right choice or the best choice, those are not how people make decisions. I don't want to get fired. I want a bigger bonus next time. I want the company not to shine a spotlight on me as the person that broke things. That, that's those interesting. Basic, so, let's, yeah. so, so that is, I would say, average, right? Like and probably average skews to not early adopters, but average buyer. You mentioned you work with large companies and with smaller companies. So yes. My sense is the smaller companies or even the large company introducing a new offering that's new to the market needs to find the early adapter profile of a buyer that is willing to do more than just say, hey, I don't want to get fired. Like they they are looking, mm. they love their job, they want to be the best, or they maybe they want to get promoted versus they're worried about getting fired, right? Like yeah. There could be another motive set of motivations. What What's your using the combination of CR conversion rate optimization and the kind of our primal motivations, how, how do you spot the early adapters and uh, how do you talk to them differently than the rest? I don't need to address this because Jeffrey Moore did a fantastic job of addressing it. His book, Crossing the Chasm, talks exactly about this. How do you cross the chasm from the super early adopters to the mainstream and he talks about head pins, like in a bowling scenario, yeah. you have to have certain small niche verticals that you slightly customize for, and then they broaden out, knock down other bowling pins, and then you get to the mainstream market. So that's really well addressed in that book. I don't think I have anything. But I don't think, I don't think with all respect to Jeffrey in his book, I don't think he is a neuroscientist. So I, no. I don't know if he described, he maybe describes, hey, there's a bigger pain in this industry. But I think he doesn't go and describe the profile of what that early adapt, like the psychological, motivational makeup of that early adapter. How do you spot them? What are you, I, I like, don't think you... there are early adapters. Uh, adopters. Uh, I think younger companies have fewer anchors. They're not dragging them around. They don't have enough, uh, a lot of momentum in certain directions. So they can be more nimble just because they don't have a, a dog in the fight. They're just not anchored mm. to anything. So that's their advantage primarily. They don't have cultural and bureaucratic momentum to overcome. They don't have ecosystems of entrenched other companies around their current offering. That's why big companies often lose and can't see innovation coming. It's not that they mm. don't see it. It's because it's, it's just too much to give up milking the cow, if I'll use another analogy, and the profits they're making off of their current setup. I think of it more like that, not as individuals within the companies being progressive. So you don't think the you don't think the there's a psych. So that's this is interesting because we're curious, and if you find it, let me know. But we started when we started, we were working with enterprises, and we did notice that there's some personality 
traits that seemed, at least to us, without the lens of neuroscience exactly, but there were some commonalities. So people had, maybe they are in a large enterprise, but they were in a startup before, or maybe they are already advising other, advising somehow startups or participating in the innovation ecosystem in addition to their role. So there was, the, it felt like there were some common threads the, and the there was maybe the fear of losing a job was not didn't feel like that was the biggest motivator for no I, I was using that as an example people. but yeah. group norming and fitting in with the corporate culture is important there's some where uh, move fast and break things Zuckerberg's right. original idea okay that's one thing or the other there's plenty of cultures that are don't rock the boat and we do everything by consensus they're even whole Com- countries that do things that way. In Asia, for example, that's the default. Group think is the default. You don't make individual decisions. The, being a maverick is not a good thing or doing things on your own. It really depends on the larger corporate culture that things are embedded in and the risk tolerance of the company. Do you get promoted for trying new things or do you get slapped down for trying new things? And so I would look at the corporate culture first and foremost, because like you say, it's a self-selecting group and people that want to be employed in that corporate culture and bend to it to some degree or um, usually completely. I see. So that's very interesting. So the dominant trait is the culture of the company, not the individual's predisposition. Exactly. The behavioral norms within the company. And if there is like different within some companies, there are different subcultures, right? Then that's probably something yes. that you could pick up on. That's exactly. The salespeople are different yeah. than the manufacturing yeah. people. Yeah. The salespeople might be mavericks within the company, but but the overall culture is still top down is being enforced or on the different functions as well. Where were you when I was trying to figure this out, Tim? I We should have done this much <laughs> earlier. Look, I can't thank you enough. I, I So much, so many topics. I know we jumped around from the kind of two, two books that you've written. And I think they're, like you said, they connect, they connect for you. But I think fundamentally, they also connect for all of us. Because what, what you're basically, the shortcut in my mental little brain is, for conversion rate optimization is it's a very extremely easily measurable way to drive behavior change in a kind of a very maybe digital sphere, but it's driving like whether it's from micro conversions to education, to making decision and commitment. And you've brought up your core book is about behaviors and how they change or not right in us. Yeah. And so this has been really fascinating to bridge those gaps. What kind of words of last kind of three tips from your both of your books that you would want to offer for our audience that they would take away and apply immediately if in the marketing role, right? What are mm. the three things mm. of your lessons? Well, I'll give you a, a couple of specifics and one more general. The specific is a lot of marketers avoid controversy or pain and negative motivation has been shown to be about two, two and a half times, three times more effective than positive in most contexts. I sell tooth whitening by telling you that you have yellow, ugly teeth, you keep your mouth closed, you're, you have resting bastard face, you're gonna die alone, and then you wanna do tooth whitening. Not You'll have a bright smile. That's not the way to sell tooth whitening. Lean into sell the, the pain. So basically sell, sell the pain. Sell, Start sell with the, the pain. pain, it's much more effective. Yeah. And that that's crucial. Hold on, hold on. Uh, Let me brush my teeth right now. Extra. No, no, it's all right. It wasn't <laughs> you in particular. I was just an example I use in my book. Pain is much more activating because the goal of a marketer, and this is at a meta level, is to move us off of our comfortable spot. Because when we're mm. on our comfortable spot, the default is doing nothing. So you can move mm. us off the comfortable spot by upside surprise or downside. And downside is more effective. And you can combine okay. them. You can say, first... Oh my God, this, this is hell. Oh, what? imagine what heaven would be like. And that delta, that shock absorber bounce over a pothole, that perturbation is what makes us care. That's how much we're willing to uh, pay to solve the problem. So the negative, do, the, what is at the end of the world scenario and what it could be like. What, well, yeah, exactly. And yeah, the, okay. the difference between those and moving me off my comfortable spot and is really important. The other thing is we're all human, tell stories. Everything should be wrapped up in stories. A lot of B2B companies make the mistake of uh, relying too much on data or ROI or financial stuff or technical specs. Big mistake. We're designed to consume experiences in stories. 
Like, hey, mm-hmm. Alex, if you go down that road and you go take a left at the fork, there's a pond with fresh water. If you go to the right, there's a mama bear protecting its cubs. That's important. Me telling you that story, wrapping it up. It's not just information. Mm. We consume things in terms of stories. So stories and the stories go back to our, they're easier to remember. And so they facilitate survival. And yeah, they kind of, they, and, and, they and translate stories, from generation to generation. Yeah, and, and a, stories are also very powerful, but you have yeah. to know your audience. So if I told you a story about uh, bullfighting, and I said the bullfighter stepped into the arena, bull charged past him, he shoved the sword through its shoulder blades and killed it instantly. To someone from uh, Spain, for example, that might be a powerful story about tradition and courage and all of these positive things. Yeah. And for people from for the ethical treatment of animals, it's okay, this is barbarism and murder of helpless yeah. animals and needs to be stopped today. So you have to know your audience. So the final thing I want to leave you with, this is all a marketing summed up in one framework. Uh, know your audience first. Then you can design campaigns and business models and messaging for them. Uh, everybody does this backwards. We have a product and we're gonna, we're a product-led company. Bullshit. I call bullshit on all product-led companies. If you don't know your audience and how they live and breathe and what they care about, you cannot design business models or products or messaging for them. So everybody's- I love it. it. Tim, on this podcast, we are. this is a thrown out a challenge to PLG, product-led growth, and all the companies and it's proponents. All bullshit. All product bullshit. By the bullshit. way, Wes Bush, who wrote a book on product-led growth, was an interviewee. Yeah. I think this is good controversy. We're going to we're going to have a debate. But you're Mix saying it up. product is only relevant if you start with the audience first and then yeah. you And and you understand yeah. them and you understand their pain and you can solve their problems. It's their problem that matters, not your product. The, the old joke of I go to Home Depot and buy a drill because I need a hole. I don't want the drill. I need, right. a, hole. need a hole, right? Yeah. yeah. So where you're, so this is back to that discussion that we had where you need to find who you are, right? Like you self-select who is the person, the role and the, what's the role and what's the problems that they have. And, and then you el- educate them on the problem or de- emphasize more of their problem. And then you bring in the product or whatever is yeah. again. You're putting your education piece because that's what you always your education forward. I have my yeah. filter. I would, yeah. I have my yeah, filter. I'd say n- know your audience. Understand what they care, define a very narrow audience. Can't be everybody. Understand what they care about, then design products and messaging for that. Oh, you say don't even try to fit the product in. Just wait, like really understand your audience, which if if you don't understand their pain or what they value, what are you, what are you building? A a minimum viable product that nobody cares about. It's a very, it's actually, it's an interesting debate. We see challenges around, I think there's an evolution towards horizontal products. And I think that they, the, and we are, we went down the journey and we could come back to this, but what's, what I think is interesting is the best horizontal products actually do speak uniquely to an audience and the, in the product journey, you do identify who you are, what, what do you want to accomplish? And only then the product adapts to that. So, so I think the worlds do meet, I think the best uh, companies that have, that do have a product philosophy, they still have this nuance of who do they start with? And then they customize the product. For yeah. their- I think that may be true of platform type products that need to be customized to an audience. But in general, I wouldn't agree with that. You wouldn't agree. So the, you either if you're a point solution, you better be really pointed. <laughs> yeah. Kind of like- and you better be able to have an origin myth and attract your tribe, have a clear editorial voice that goes through all of your content and marketing. And if you don't have the, that basic of I'm flying the flag, follow me, you're in my tribe. You will not be successful based on that product feature level ever. So I what you're so again to summarize, you, let's not confuse the platforms, be it like Notion or Microsoft Office or Canva, or us trying to build a, a platform and relate to 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 the actual historical like where the success has been is very narrow audience. You well understood them. You they connect to you emotionally. And then you start 
you, you have their trust and then you're yeah. so like, Hey, you yeah. know, I hear you're this you're not Sony, you. you're not yeah. Coca-Cola. You can, yeah. you don't have hundreds of millions or decades to build an international brand. Those kind of general things are the exception, not the rule. Yeah. Amazing. I love the challenges that you've thrown out into the ecosystem. I like that you're speaking truth to marketers. Tim, where I would love to continue this, but I want to respect your time. Um, we can do a part two if you ever want. Part two to. is a, is in the making right now because I'm I'm thinking through our go to market optimization, so to speak, that we should be doing. Um, but this has been amazing. So what I would love for our audience to do is to find ways to read your books, connect with you, learn about the services you provide for top CMOs. Tell us about that. Yeah, happy to do it. The best way to find out about the book, there's different editions, Chinese, Russian, Brazilian, Portuguese, go to primalbrain.com. And if you're interested in my executive advisory for digital growth, that's basically me, unlimited, on call, tied to a senior executive at your company, you can find that on timash.com. Amazing. Tim, you guys have seen that you've sh shaken me up in this conversation. <laughs> so if you want to be shaken up and, and see the real, where real growth comes from, I think, Tim, but thank you for showing it versus talking about it. This has been fascinating. It's so great to have you as a guest on the pod. Oh, it was a lot of fun. Thanks, Alex.